What's up guys, hope you're having a good day. In this video, we're going to be breaking down all the main card fights taking place this weekend at UFC Fight Night, Edwards versus Mohamed from a betting perspective. Hopefully, you'll be able to use the information in this video to make better betting decisions. And if you'd like to watch breakdown videos for the prelim fights, which I won't have time to cover in this video, head on over to my website, MMABettingTips.com. Link for that in the description below. On my site, you'll find 5-10 to 10 minute breakdown videos for every fight on this card, as well as lab bets, prop bets, and all kinds of other good stuff. And it is that point in the video where we do another business deal. If you would like a prop bet live stream this weekend for UFC Fight Night Edwards vs. Mohamed, you already know what to do. Hit the like button below. If this video gets 200 likes, I will do that prop bet live stream this week. Weekend. And last weekend, obviously, those prop bets produced around a four and a half unit profit. So hopefully we could do it again this weekend. Smash the like button and also hit subscribe if you haven't already. So we now get into the first fight on this card that I want to talk about, which is going to be Angela Hill against Ashley Yoda. So if we take a look at the odds on this fight, and do you know what? If we bring up our implied probability calculator as well. So if we take a look at the odds on this fight, we can see that Angela Hill is one of the biggest favourites on the card, an even bigger favourite than Nazrat Hakarast, uh, which I find a little bit wacky, to be honest with you, because Rafa Garcia is not great, and Garcia is taking the fight on less than a week's notice. But the odds maker is getting a little bit aggressive with these odds on Angela Hill, and we can currently see that she's around an average of 1.25, which is minus 400 for an implied probability of 80%. That means Yoda is currently around about an average of 4.0, uh, which is plus 300 for an implied probability of 25%. So whenever you see a fighter in the odds range that we see Angela Hill in, realistically, they've got to have pretty much no way to lose, right? The probability assigned to these odds is 80%, which means... You know, you'd have to give Hill a better than 80% chance of winning to get any value here. That basically means she can't have really any way to lose. And whenever I see a fighter like Angela Hill in that odds range of about 1.25, it always gets my spidey senses tingling. Because as you can see from her record, you know, she's 12 and 9. She's prone to losing. And the reason why she's prone to losing is because she does have big holes that her opponents can exploit. Most notably, her takedown defense and ground game. Hill's takedown defense has improved a lot in recent years. But her ground game is still at a very low level to the point where, you know, this is what cost her against, you know, Michelle Waterson, uh, you know, Claudia Gadeja. And it's one of those things where we are seeing exponential gains to Hill's takedown defense, but I don't feel her ground game is really catching up. It's still one of those situations where when Hill does get taken down, she is still super weak off her back. So this is an interesting fight because obviously Angela Hill is the striker. Ashley Yoda is the grappler. So certainly Yoda has a path to victory if she can get this fight to the ground. But the question becomes... Can Yoda get the fight to the ground, right? And as you can see, you know, from Yoda's salty record of 8-6, and six, she's not exactly prolific either. So you've got, you know, both Hill and Yoda, not exactly rock-solid fighters. They're both definitely improving, uh, but they're not the kind of fighters that you would really trust with your money, especially in this odds range. You know, the, Angela Hill's unbattable in this odds range. So when we're looking at whether or not Yoda can get this fight to the ground, what I would say is that Angela Hill's takedown offense has dramatically improved in recent years. She really does a good job now of using her striking in reverse to, you know, spot subtle little changes in the body language of her opponent so that when they do come forward and start fishing for that takedown, she can immediately, you know, back up, clear her legs, and stuff the takedown before her opponent gets close enough to actually tie her up. So Hill's getting much better at reading the takedown entry. And when her opponent does tie her up, Hill is also doing a much better job of, like I say, clearing her legs, getting her back against the cage, and stuffing the takedown. I, I Honestly, like I'm very, very impressed by how much Hill's takedown offense has improved. It's It's got a lot better. It used to be very, very bad. Her takedown offense has got a lot better. It's not bulletproof. But it's a lot better. 
What I would say is that Hill's takedown offense does get worse as the fight goes on because Hill does tend to slow down as the fight goes on. Although her gas tank is also one of those things that's really improved alongside her takedown offense. And now usually against a, a, a grappler, I'd be saying, you know, Hill will be at risk of being taken down in the second half of the fight when she starts to come a little bit more or become a little bit more flat footed and easier to grab a hold of. But Yoda also slows down as the fight goes on. Yoda is another fighter who has improved her gas tank, gas tank tremendously, but she also slows down as the fight goes on. So, you know, I guess it, it, it should kind of balance out and even out. So the reason why I do think Hill is capped as a big favourite here is because Angela Hill's obviously got a base in Muay Thai, right? She's got, you know, good upper body strength. She's very physically imposing in the clinch, very strong in the clinch. And if you look at Ashley Yoda's style of, 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 of offensive wrestling, she's one of these fighters that, doesn't really have very effective single leg or double leg takedowns. I think a big part of this is Yoda's quite long and tall for the strawweight division. She's abnormally long and tall for the division at five foot seven with a seven with a sixty nine inch reach. So because she's like abnormally tall and long, she does struggle to get in deep on the hips and legs of her opponent. And so most of Ashley Yoda's takedowns actually come from trips and throws. But she fishes for takedowns usually very high above her opponent's hips. So because Angela Hill has that base in Muay Thai, very strong in the clinch, you know, very strong hips, it's not easy to upset Angela Hill's balance and take her down from trips and throws. The way you get Angela Hill down is either through explosive trips and throws, the kind that Loma Lukwin may use to get Hill down, but Ashley Yoda doesn't really have that explosiveness to her trips and throws, or traditional single legs and double legs, which is what Watterson and Gadea use to get her down. So this is an interesting fight because Yoda is actually a very high-level grappler in the context of the strawweight division. When I say you know a fight is a very high-level grappler or a very low-level grappler, I'm always talking about you know within the context of the division, the the kind of opponent Yoda is going to be going up against. So. When I say Yoda's a high-level grappler, please don't think I'm comparing her to a Mackenzie Dunn. But in the context of this matchup, she is light years ahead of Angela Hill on the ground. And if this fight does go to the ground, I'd expect Yoda to absolutely dominate and cause Hill major, major problems. I do think she's really going to struggle to get the fight to the ground, though. Particularly in the first half of the fight, when Hill is still fresh, still light on her feet, still very strong in the clinch. And then, you know, what the problem is, is Hill starts to get tired in the second half of the fight and will be easier to take down. Yoda's probably going to be tired as well because they both slow down as the fight goes on. It's also worth noting that Angela Hill was already training, I believe. Well, she was already in camp for some reason uh, to take on Ashley Yoda the first time they were scheduled to fight a few weeks ago. Whereas I do think Yoda actually did come off the bench. If you check out Angela Hill's Instagram profile, there's just tons and tons and tons of training footage, training pictures on her Instagram where you can see she's in the gym all the time. We also know that, you know, she's always looking for a fight. She's taken lots of short notice matchups, you know, over the last 12 to 18 months to two years. And so Angela Hill at this stage seems like one of these fighters that's always ready. So the short notice matchup for Angela Hill, I don't think is going to be as big of a deal as it could be for someone like Ashley Yoda, who you know, has had a history of slowing down as the fight goes on and is now stepping up to take this fight on, what, maybe two, three weeks notice? So the short notice call-up for Hill doesn't bother me that much because she's used to stepping up uh, on short notice. She seems like one of these anytime, any place, anywhere kind of fighters. Whereas I think, you know... Yoda's gas tank might look a little bit sketchy. So this is one of those fights where it's a clear dog or pass for me. There's no way you can bet Angela Hill at these odds because if she slips on a banana skin and ends up on the ground, Yoda's good enough to cause her absolute hell. But at the same time, because Yoda's methods for getting fights to the ground are not going to be particularly effective against Hill because you know Yoda's trips and throws 
are the kind of takedown he'll usually deals quite well with. I don't really want to gamble money on Yoda either, especially with her being on short notice. I just don't really trust that she's going to have the energy, the physicality, the explosiveness to get in deep on the legs and hips of Hill, you know, past the sixth or seventh minute of the fight. So this one's a pass from me. I'm not going to go in on uh, on this fight. It's a pass. Sorry to be boring. Um, but I do think if you want to bet this fight, you kind of have to go with Yoda. Doggo pass. But it's not for me. We now move on to the next fight. We're now going to talk about Eric Anders against Darren Stewart. So if we take a look at the odds on this fight, we can see that Darren Stewart currently floating around about an average of 1.57 which is minus 175 for an implied probability of 64%. And if we take a look at the odds on Anders, currently floating around about an average of 2.50, uh, which is plus 150 for an implied probability of 40%. So when we look at fighters like Darren Stewart and Eric Anders, we could spend a lot of time you know, studying footage of both these guys, and I have, you know, I put, put about, you know, an hour and a half worth of research into studying their past fights this week. And we could talk about how they match up from a technical point of view, who has the advantage grappling, who has the advantage striking. We will talk about that stuff in just a moment. But I think whenever you've got a matchup like this, trying to predict, you know, who's going to win for betting purposes is a bit of a fool's errand, if I'm honest with you. And it's, it's not really that productive uh, for me, I think this is a classic, cl classic fight where, you know, realistically, this isn't the best card. I think we could all be honest and say there's not the best quality matchup on this card. You know, there's not too many interesting fights on this card, and so I think a big issue when you get a card like this without very many interesting matchups, people are drawn to fights like Anders versus Stewart, and maybe over analyze it a little bit to try and hunt for bets because there aren't really any other obvious bets in other matchups right but for me it is just absolute bankroll suicide betting on either of these guys because bad fight iq bad decision making has kind of defined both of their careers I completely get why Darren Stewart's the favourite here. I think he should be the favourite. I think he's more solid out of the two guys. But still, sketchy fight IQ. And lots of weaknesses that Anders may be able to exploit if Anders actually shows up and fights smart for once. I know a lot of people are thinking of betting Darren Stewart this week. And I would just say, if you are, just consider the odds. And understand that at these odds, you've got to give him a better than 64% chance of winning in order to get any value. What I would say if you're thinking of betting on, uh, on Stewart this week is go and watch his fight against Bartos Fabinski. Look at some of the bad decision making he made in this matchup. Look at how much time he spent hesitating in bad positions which enabled Fabinski to rack up big points on him. And if you if you watch that fight, and you still think you're getting a good deal on Stewart at these odds, go for it. Bet him. But I would I would urge anyone thinking of betting Stewart this weekend just to understand that he isn't a good bet. You know, you can bet him and he might win, but, you know, really to get a good deal on Stewart, you'd have to give him about a 70% chance of winning here. And... For so many reasons, I don't think that's possible. Mainly down to his fight IQ and decision making. So, it, the, the, really, these two fighters are not the kind of fighters that I like to bet. I like to bet on smart fighters, you know, tactical, strategic fighters who are game planning to win. And um, I feel like in so many of Anders and Darren Stewart's past performances, they've made decisions in fights which have cost them the victory, right? They've kind of self-destructed. And again, we were talking about the records of Angela Hill and Ashley Yoda tell a story. And we can see, you know, the win-to-loss ratio of Stewart's are great, 12, 12 and 6. Not great for Anders either, right? 13 and 5. You know, from a, from a technical point of view, there are so many things that Stewart and Anders do well. But you know what George St. Pierre said, right? Fighting is 90% mental 
and both Anders and Stuart really lack that that mental aspect of the game. But I feel in very different ways. I feel like Anders' mentality lets him down in the sense that he's quite often very passive. He struggles to pull the trigger. It's almost like he's holding back. You know, from a technical point of view, Anders is pretty good everywhere, right? Very tough, great chin, you know, reasonably strong grappler, very physically imposing, very athletic, not a bad striker. When you look at Anders, you know, in a vacuum from a technical point of view, there's not much to be critical of. But you see long periods of inactivity in his fights where he just lets rounds slip away from him because he's not doing much. It's almost like Anders lacks confidence. Darren Stewart, I feel, is the opposite. I feel Darren Stewart has the the heart, the desire, the will to win. But I feel like he makes really poor decisions in fights. So, for example, you know, he'll try to take down better grapplers. And because he's very weak on his back, that gives them opportunity to win a scramble, put him on his back and rack up control time. Or... You know, he'll he'll kind of, you know, fall into the trap of spending too long in a bad position, too long trying to work his way back up to his feet or too long in the clinch. Um, he'll fall into the trap of maybe taking the last 30 seconds to a minute off in a round and allowing his opponent to steal it. I think Anders is one of these guys that lacks confidence and, 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 and sometimes struggles to let it go. Whereas Stewart is just not a very good decision maker and his fight IQ really lets him down. So the mental aspect for both these guys is very lacking. And that means you never really know what you're going to get from them because you can spend 10 hours researching these fighters if you want. You know, you could spend 20 hours researching these fighters. But ultimately, because they're so inconsistent and quite often their decision making plays such a huge role in the outcome of their matchups, you know, it's really mental masturbation researching their fights because you never know what they're going to do. You know, they're just not consistent enough to feel confident in being able to predict how they're going to perform. And for me, Darren Stewart and Eric Anders are just guys I would never bet unless you can get an awesome deal in the odds. You know, if Stewart, if the odds were the other way around and I could get Stewart at, uh, you know, 2.50 or whatever... Anders is, that would be a great deal because I do lean towards Stewart here, but that's not the case. He's a pretty big favourite and you don't want to be betting guys like Stewart as a big favourite. So from a technical point of view, I would say Eric Anders is by far the better grappler. You know, Darren Stewart is an extremely low-level grappler, very weak off his back. You know, super, super low-level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Anders isn't a great grappler either, but if Anders comes in with a grappling-heavy game plan, should be able to take Stewart down quite easily, control him on the ground, pick up an easy win. But you know Anders doesn't make the best decisions and he's probably going to win a ki- try and win a kickboxing match, which is a much tougher task because Stewart moves well. You know, he's got a great gas tank for a big, physically strong, athletic guy. You know, great kicks, heavy hands, good movement. And, uh, you know, Anders is one of these guys that starts strong and tends to become sloppier as the fight goes on almost like he loses concentration and like i say anders also has long periods of inactivity whereas stewart's a little bit more aggressive stewart does have periods of inactivity as well but i feel like anders is more of a volume striker whereas stewart you know does big damage and leaves a big impression on the judges when he lands because of you know how physically imposing he is how hard he hits so this one's an easy pass for me i definitely lean stewart just because i'd rather bet on a guy that has that desire, that will to win, rather than a guy who holds back and doesn't pull the trigger and seems to lack confidence. But there's, I don't want to bet this fight. This one's not for me. I'll definitely be passing on this one. So we now go into the next fight. And I feel that at this point in the card where we've been talking about, you know, Hill and Yoda and their flaws. We've been talking about, you know, the 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 lack of fight IQ, and not the best, you know, mentality from Stuart and Anders. And we now go into Matthias Nikolai against Manel Cap, and we're going to talk a lot about, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of the same stuff. And it's kind of like, for me. 
going through Stuart and Anders and Cap versus Nicolau, knowing that those two matchups are on the main card kind of highlights to me how dodgy a UFC card this is because, you know, you've just got very passive, gun-shy, low-volume fighters on this main card. You know, Anders, Nikolai, Cap, and that doesn't really usually produce for a very, very entertaining card. So anyway, let's talk about Mateus Nikolai against Manel Cap. So this will be Cap's second fight in the UFC. This is Nikolai's second stint in the UFC. He actually came into the UFC when he was very, very young. And I'm not sure why they ever got rid of Nikolai. He's a decent fighter. Uh, you can see that you know he had a decent run in the UFC going 3-1. and one. So I never understand why he got released. But he's back now. And... Uh, you know, he's decent. He is decent. Uh, 28 years old, 5'6 with a 66-inch reach. Cap is 5'5 five five with a 68-inch reach. So both guys roughly about the same size. Both guys roughly about the same age. And if we take a look at the odds here, we can see that Cap currently around about a 1.74 favourite, which is minus 135 for an implied probability of 57%. And if we take a look at the odds on Nikolai, currently around about an average of 2.15, which is going to be plus 115 for an implied probability of 47%. So this is going to be Nikolai's last fight against Felipe Efrain. And I'll just leave it running in the background while I kind of talk you through how these guys match up. So Nikolai is in the white shorts with the, with the lovely uh, tattoo on his back. So... In the last fight, I was kind of talking about how, because of their bad fight IQ, Anders and Stewart are not really the kind of guys that I like to bet on, because I can't trust them. You never know what you're going to get from fighters like that. I feel exactly the same about Nikolai and Cap. This is a very strange matchup. Nikolai and Cap have both got the same weakness. In that they're very, very, very passive. They just don't pull the fucking trigger. And it's infuriating. These two guys are the kind of fighters where if you bet them, you're just left shouting at your TV. Like begging them to do something. Because they'll just have long periods of inactivity in their fights where they do absolutely nothing. And Nikolai and Cap are both particularly frustrating. Because they're the kind of fighter who even when it's clear they're losing... And the fight is slipping away from them. And they're running out of time. Even if they haven't taken any damage. Even if they're not hurt. Even if they're not tired. They still won't let it go. They still won't do what they need to do. To pick the pace up and give themselves a chance of winning. It's infuriating to watch them. Nikolai and Cap have both got you know, very different styles. But they both share that same weakness. In that they're very passive. They just don't pull the trigger. And I feel this is possibly one of the reasons why Nikolai was released from the UFC in his first stint. Because he's just a boring fighter and so is Cap. They're just painful to watch. So if we examine how they both match up. So Cap is a little bit difficult to kind of work out what style of fighting Cap has got. Because the way he moves, the way he kind of bounces out in and out of his opponent's range and looks to hit these big explosive takedowns. He kind of looks and moves like a wrestler. But then whenever I've seen Cap on the ground in his fights in Rising, he's looked super low level. So I'm not actually sure if he is a wrestler. He certainly fights like he wants to be a wrestler, but he doesn't really have the grappling to back, him up, back it up. If he does come into this fight looking to grapple, that could get him into a little bit of trouble because Nikolai is a reasonably skilled Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. And from what I've seen of Cap, he's like white belt on the ground, exceptionally low level. There's some footage of him, you know, on the ground against some of his, you know, opponents in Rising. If you're interested, go back to his fights. I'll probably pull up which ones uh, he looks poor in. If we look at uh, Cap's record, if you go and look at his fight against Ulka Sasaki from back in 2018, you'll see that he looks just very, 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 very super low level on the ground. In fact, fuck it, let's actually... Uh, Let's see if we can bring up some footage and I'll show you firsthand. So, Sasaki versus Cap, right? Uh, here we go. Here we go. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So, if we scroll through here, if 
we scroll through, there we go, there we go, there we go. So, one thing that I do have to say is, obviously, even though Cap looks super low level on the ground here, this fight was back in 2018. With Cap being a, you know, a pretty young guy, chances are he's made big, 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 big improvements since this fight. But you can see him give up a super weak takedown there, and he's just incredibly weak off his back. Uh, you know, Nikolai, reasonably good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. If this fight goes to the ground, Nikolai should cause Cap huge problems unless Cap has made big improvements since this fight. You know, Cap's ground game looked absolutely awful in this fight against Ulka Sasaki. I know that Sasaki is, you know, a, a decent grappler. You know, he's been in the UFC. Beautiful back takes, you know, nasty rear naked chokes. Sasaki's also one of these guys with abnormally long limbs for the division, which means he can tie up, control his opponents, put them in bad positions on the ground. But you can just see the cap is very, very low level on the ground. He just doesn't really know what to do in these positions. If we scroll through into round uh, round two, I think you see a little bit more of uh, cap's weaknesses on the ground. Obviously, he might have improved a lot since then, but I'm just trying to make the point that you know, you're seeing here firsthand Cap looked extremely low level on the ground back in 2018. And so if he hasn't made significant improvements since this fight, you know, uh, a decent level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt like Nikolai is going to cause this guy murder on the ground. We just skip ahead a little bit. I'm sure there's some grappling coming up soon. There we go. You see him give up a really weak take down there. So yeah, Nikolai's going to have a huge advantage on the ground, but from what I've seen, Nikolai's offensive wrestling isn't great. If we pause, that is paused. Nikolai's offensive wrestling isn't great. And, you know, Cap is one of these athletic, explosive guys that bounces around, lots of good movement. And so, you know, Cap might be able to use his athleticism in reverse to keep the fight standing. And if the fight stays standing, this is a lot more difficult to predict. But on the ground, you can see Cap is absolutely terrible here. Nikolai should dominate on the ground unless Cap has made big improvements, which we can't really quantify because we haven't, you know, we haven't seen those improvements. There hasn't been a lot of grappling in his fight since he since since he fought Ulka Sasaki. Standing up is a lot more difficult to predict because Nikolai and Cap are both very low volume strikers. So Cap is one of these guys who likes to... Oh, nice little single leg take down there from Nikolai though. But Cap is one of these guys that likes to kind of bounce around, you know, use a lot of footwork and just blitz in and out of his opponent's range and kind of blitz them with straight punches. And Cap is one of these guys that likes to fight either all the way inside, you know, spamming, blitzing shots or all the way out to his opponent's range where he's you know, stood far enough away from his opponent where they can't land on him in kickboxing range. So that means that either Nikolai is going to have to go to cap in order to land anything, which he never does. You can see here he's utilizing a predominantly kick, you know, counter striking style. Or Nikolai is going to have to catch cap when he comes in. Now that's not easy to do because while cap's not the best striker, he is quite fast and explosive. So it really depends on Nikolai's ability to be able to read Cap, which I'm not sure. I'm not sure, man. Like I say, Cap is one of these guys that does move quite well. He's one of these guys that doesn't throw much, but when he does throw much, he's quite fast, quite accurate, quite explosive. So this is one of those matchups where I'm finding it really difficult to read because I would give Cap, you know, a reasonable advantage standing. Because I do think that Nikolai is going to struggle to catch him when he blitzes forward because of how fast Cap is. But I hate to bet on a guy like Cap because he shares the same weakness as Eric Anders in that, in that he just doesn't pull the trigger enough. There's long periods of inactivity in his fights. He's very passive and he doesn't show any urgency. When he's losing rounds, he just doesn't show any urgency to get it going. And don't get me wrong, Nikolai's got all those weaknesses as well. Very, very passive also. But what I would say about Nikolai is he does have a huge advantage on the ground from what I've seen. If Nikolai can get this fight to the ground, he's likely to cause Cap huge problems. But having said that, Cap is a compact, athletic guy. He moves well. I'm sure that he has improved his ground game a lot since we last really saw a good amount of his grappling against Ulka Sasaki. So this is one of those fights where, again, like Anders and Stewart, both guys are just deeply flawed. Cap is passive. Nikolai is passive. 
You know, both guys are quite happy to let rounds slip away from him and fights slip away from him. You know, it's, it's these aren't the kind of guys I like to bet. Gun to my head, I take Nikolai because, you know, you see he's got pretty nice reactive double leg and single leg takedowns. And as I've just shown you in the Olka Sasaki fight, Cap is dreadful on the ground. I think if Nikolai can get this fight to the ground, Cap's in big trouble. But because these guys are super passive, I'm not about betting either of these fighters. This one is an easy, easy, easy pass for me. We now go into one of the very few fights on this card that's actually interesting from a betting point of view. I feel like a lot of the fights on this card either feature debutants, you know, guys stepping up on short notice, or, you know, really low quality matchups where the bookies have kind of nailed the odds. You know, there's a lot of favourites on this card, right? There's one, two... Uh, what a lot of big favorites, sorry, right? One, two, three, four, five, you know, six, seven, eight, you know, eight big favorites on on a, on a 12 fight card. It, it doesn't give us much room to maneuver unless we see a lot of value on the underdogs here, right? So it is a very tricky card for betting. But with Dan Ige and Gavin Tucker being in that even money odds range, this is one of the most interesting fights from a betting point of view. So if we look at the odds on this fight, we can currently see uh, Ige floating around an average of, call it, 1.66, which is minus 152 for an implied probability of 60%. And if we take a look at the odds on Gavin Tucker, he is currently around about an average of 2.25, which is plus 125 for an implied probability of 40%. So, in the video so far, we've been talking about guys like Eric Anders, Darren Stewart, you know, Manel Cap, and Mateus Nikolai, who are a little bit flawed mentally because they either don't make the best decisions in fights or maybe don't have the will to win. Maybe there's a little bit of self sabotage going on where they struggle to pull the trigger. Dan Ige and Gavin Tucker are the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Because these boys have got the heart, the fire in their belly, and the desire to win. And, you know, these two fighters are the exact kind of fighters I love to bet on. Because whether you bet on Ige or Taka and they win or lose, you know win or lose, they're going to show up and fight for your money 100% of the time. They're ruthlessly consistent and you know exactly what you're getting on them. Uh, you're getting from them. Why bet a guy like Darren Stewart at 1.57 or Eric Anders at 2.55 when you have absolutely no idea what either of those idiots are going to show up and do when you could bet on you know Dan Ige at 1.65 or Gavin Tucker at 2.35 and you know for a fact when you lock in your bet these boys are going to show up and fight for your money and win or lose they're going to try and win this is the kind or these are the kind of fighters you want to be putting your money on because when you research them you know there's a very, very high probability that the version of the fighters you see in the past fights when you research them are the versions you're going to get when, you know, these these two boys go to war on Saturday. So, with Taka and Ige, it's a really interesting matchup because from a stylistic point of view, I actually think Taka's better than Ige almost everywhere. But I actually lean towards Dan Ige, which is not something I'll ever say really. Usually I'm always, you know, favouring technique. And I don't let the intangibles outweigh technique. But this is one of the situations where I do think the intangibles are going to be the difference here. And I do like Ige in this matchup. If we look at the tail of the tape, Ige is 29 years old, 5 foot 7 with a 71 inch reach. Which is notable because Gavin Tucker is 34 years old, 5 foot 6 with a 66 inch reach. Tucker has a painfully short reach for the featherweight division. Ige's actually got quite a short reach for the featherweight division, but 66 inch reach for a featherweight is painfully short. You know, it'd even be kind of short in the bantamweight division. So that does give Ige a very generous 5 inch reach advantage over Tucker. And that reach advantage is significant because we know Ige hits like a truck, right? The clue is in the name. Oh, he's changed his name. <laughs> when he first came into the UFC, his nickname was Dynamite Dan Ige. It's now uh, Dan 50K Ige. Very nice. But anyway, his old, his old nickname was a clue to how dangerous he is standing, right? Dynamite Dan Ige. 
big power in his hands. So that 5-inch reach advantage is going to make it easier for Ige to get inside the range where he can land his big power right hand and cause Tucker big, 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 big trouble. So from a technical point of view, like I say, I do think Tucker is better than Ige almost everywhere apart from pure Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I'd even go as far as saying... Tucker is a stronger wrestler, which I know a lot of people will call shenanigans on. But if you do a little bit of fight research, you'll understand what I mean. Ige is primarily a grappler, right? You can see him in his gi here. But Ige's grappling is really, really weird. There are certain grapplers out there who are very, very good offensively, but very, very bad defensively. And Ige fits that mold. Ige's offensive wrestling is good. Ige is very heavy from top position. His submissions are dangerous. His ground and pound is devastating. But what's really weird about Ige is that his takedown offense is very bad. And he, he is just extremely weak off his back. It's so strange because from top position, Ige is a nightmare. But on the bottom, he's like a pussycat. It's a very, very strange phenomenon. In terms of grappling, I feel like Tucker's the, the, the total package. He's decent offensively. And he's he's decent defensively. He might not have, you know, the dangerous submissions that Ige's got. He might not be able to inflict the kind of damage Ige can inflict from top position. But I feel like as a package, Tucker is reasonably good at everything related to grappling. Whereas I feel Ige is excellent at some things in the grappling domain and very, very bad at others. And therefore, I would say Tucker overall is the better grappler. But it's nuanced by the fact that Ige, when he gets into certain positions, is, is devastating. So, for example, if Ige gets on top of Tucker, Ige poses much more of a threat to Tucker than Tucker poses to Ige. But then overall, Tucker is the more solid grappler. It's very hard to describe unless you go back and watch these two fighters. Uh, some fights in particular that may help illustrate the point I'm trying to make. The Beck Dick fight's a good one. The Aguilar fight in particular is another good one. Even the Jordan Griffin one is a good one. There are some holes to Ige's grappling. But what I would say about Dan Ige is that he is making absolutely massive improvements from fight to fight i'm very 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 impressed by the improvements that dan ige is making and i think this is largely because you know when ige first came into the ufc he was kind of trying to juggle uh being a professional fighter and managing you know a full-time job right working under ali abdelaziz to manage fighters managed by ali abdelaziz and this is a job that he takes very very seriously so I think as time's gone on and Dan's had more success in the UFC, he's dedicated more time to do his, his MMA training. Ali's probably cut him some slack as well with how well he's been doing. I'm sure he's managed by Ali. And so this is one of those situations where as we see Ige further his career in MMA and spend less time on the management side of things, he just gets better and better. You know, some of the weaknesses we saw from Ige early in his UFC career. You know, his gas tank wasn't particularly good. He did used to slow down a lot as the fight went on. But in his last two fights against Barboza and Keita, his gas tank has looked fucking excellent, quite frankly. Absolutely brilliant. He's, he's, he's outworked Edson Barboza over three rounds, which is not an easy thing to do. And, you know, we're also seeing massive improvements to his striking. You know, defensively, he didn't used to be very good. But his, 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 uh, his defense, his movement setting up his power punches a lot better Ige's gas tank and his striking and making exponential gains which you know means every time we see Dan Ige it's likely he's going to look better than he did the last time we saw him so when it comes to striking Tucker is definitely the more technical striker here he moves better than Ige he throws a higher volume he throws a wider range of strikes but when it comes to striking, I actually do give the edge to Ige here. Because Tucker is one of these, you know, neat and tidy, you know, pretty strikers with beautiful technique. But he's more of a volume striker. He kind of just touches you. And he touches you with big volume. But he, he doesn't ever really seem like he hurts his opponents, right? You know, when he is... You know, when he's he's racked up a big amount of strikes on guys like Sung Woo Choi 
and just in jeans and then eventually got the finish by submission when he wore him down it is through volume it's not necessarily you know damage inflicted I, I do think Tucker is much more of a volume striker whereas if you look at Dan Ige he is one of these guys that just has abnormally freakish power for the division you know he's like a Nico Price Ige is one of these guys that when he lands on his opponents they have a look in their eyes like I can't fucking believe you just hit me that hard it's like freakish power like you know certain fighters have it right like Nico Price is the best example I can think of in the UFC at the moment when he lands you can see like it really gets his opponent's attention Dan Henderson was another one right Dan Ige is one of these guys that's just got major power in that right hand the five inch reach advantage is going to make it easier to land that power right hand and Tucker's striking defense isn't great you know, it's decent early on when he's light on his feet and he moves very well. But as the fight wears on, Tucker becomes a little bit more flat-footed, a little bit easier to hit. And we know from Ige's fight against Barboza that Ige can be one of these guys that gets better and better as the fight goes on now. He's scrappy, he's tough, he's got that will to win. And he just finds ways to win, man. So what I would say about this fight is... What I would say about this fight is... I don't think either guy has got a major advantage on the ground, right? Tucker has used quite a lot of grappling in his last three fights. But Tucker's grappling's not absolutely bulletproof, right? Ige's got dangerous submissions, can inflict big damage from ground and pound. You know, Tucker can have su some success with his grappling here, but Ige can definitely hold his own on the ground. And one thing I've noticed about Tucker is that because he's primarily a striker, he does burn himself out a little bit if he grapples. The more grappling the Tucker does, the more he tends to kind of slow down and become a little bit flat-footed and sloppy. Doesn't have a bad gas tank, but definitely becomes flatter as the fight goes on if he grapples hard. So if if even if Tucker does come out with a grappling-heavy game plan, takes Ige down, wears on him a little bit, racks up a bit of top control, I actually think that might work against Tucker because... Tucker will likely then slow down in the second half of the fight, which will enable Ige to kind of take over and use his big power to punish him. But like I say, Ige can hold his own on the ground. If he gets into top position, he'll even cause Tucker big problems. And Ige's submissions are pretty nasty as well. So, you know, I, I don't I don't really see uh, grappling as being too big of a path to victory for Tucker, although he may have decent periods of success with his grappling in this fight. When it comes to striking, I think we'll see a situation where, you know, Tucker might dance around Ige and outstrike him in volume. But I think it's going to be one of those matchups where Tucker's not really going to be able to hurt Ige with his hands. And Ige's going to be able to negate a lot of Tucker's volume with big single power strikes that are likely to back Tucker up, snap his head back. You know, get a reaction from people in the arena, leave a lasting impression on the judges' scorecards. So, it's one of those fights where I do I do lean towards Ige here a decent amount because I think he's got the power to knock Tucker out. He's got the power in his hands to negate a lot of Tucker's volume. He's got good enough grappling to do okay on the ground. And I trust his gas tank more. I trust his ability to finish strong more. So I definitely lean Ige here. Tucker's a live dog, but out of the two, I would prefer to go with Ige. Hope that makes sense. So we now move on to the co-main event of the evening. A very, very strange co-main event, this, uh, between Ryan Spann and Misha Serkinov. Just because, I mean, this this fight pretty much sums up this, this card, right? Serkinov and Ryan Spann as the co-main event. A little bit weird. We haven't seen Serkinov... Uh, in a really long time. He hasn't fought in 18 months since he fought Jimmy Crute in 2019. And uh, Ryan Spann, haven't seen him since September. So if we look at the tail of the tape, Spann, 29 years old, 6 foot 5 with an 81 and a half inch reach. And Misha Serkinov, 34 years old, 6 foot 3 with a 77 inch reach. So nice little reach advantage for Spann there. And... Earlier on in the video, we've been talking about how, you know, there are fighters that you just can't really trust. You know, you've got 
Anders and Stewart can't trust those guys. Nikolai Kapp can't trust those guys. And I feel Sirkinov and Span definitely fit that criteria as well. These are not fighters that you can trust. You know, if you bet on either one of these guys this weekend, it's very, very risky. But if we take a look at the odds, we can see that Span's currently floating around about an average of 2.15. I do find it very interesting that he's the underdog here. But that's plus 115 for an implied probability of 47%. If we take a look at the odds on Sirkinov, he is currently floating around uh, odds of about 1.74, which is minus 135 for an implied probability of 57%. So straight away, I need to get it out of the way. I need to say this at the very beginning. You are out of your fucking mind if you bet on Misha Sirkinov here. There's no way you can bet on Sirkinov against any able-bodied professional athlete. I don't care how good Sirkinov is. I don't care what advantages he has over Span. The man is made of glass. Misha Sirkinov is just the biggest flake box I have ever seen in the history of MMA. The guy is outrageously flaky. It's, it's insane. He holds the, the, the stupidest knockout I've ever seen. I wanted to kind of play you a quick clip of UFC Fight Pass of the actual fight showing the knockout I'm going to talk about. But I couldn't because I'm really worried that another one of my videos is going to get flagged for copyright. I've had a lot of problems with that lately. Um, so I'll just kind of show you a gif. This knockout loss to Uzdemir is the dumbest, most ridiculous, pathetic knockout I've ever seen in the history of MMA. It's stupid. It's stupid. Look at how easily he goes down here. Look at this delayed reaction on the slow-mo watch. Look at this delayed reaction. Look how he goes down. And then he just turtles up and allows Uzdemir to finish him with ground and pound. Look at that delayed reaction. It's it's, it's hands down. Like I've been watching MMA for uh, like 20 years. It's the dumbest knockout I've ever seen in my life. It's, it's ridiculous. And every time I break down a Misha Sirkinov fight... Guys pop up in the comments and they say, oh, but bro, he caught him behind the ear and it, it, it can take your equilibrium out and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, cool, cool, cool story, bro. Uh, never seen Nate Diaz get dropped with a shot like that. Never seen Mark Hunt get dropped with a shot like that. Never seen Leonard Garcia get dropped with a shot like that. Never seen Ben Rothwell get dropped with a shot like that. I'm not being funny, but if human beings got knocked down that easily with shots that soft to the back of the head, the human race would literally be extinct. Like, this is the dumbest knockout I've ever seen in my life. If you can bet Misha Sirkinov in a cage fight against another professional fighter after watching this, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I literally don't know what to tell you. Sirkinov is like the worst bet of the year. He's made of glass. And the worst part about Misha Sirkinov is that this isn't the first... That, like, that's not an isolated incident. Misha Sirkinov is one of these really weird fighters that just seems to implode if you put him in a bad position. Go watch the Glover to Teixeira fight. As soon as the fight went to the ground, even though Sirkinov is a very high-level grappler, all he wanted to do was turtle up and allow Glover to chip away at him with ground and pound. He made absolutely no effort to work his way through bad positions or get back up to his feet. Even against Jim Crute, there were moments in that fight where he tried to quit, but the referee didn't stop the fight, which woke Sirkinov up and then he kind of sprung back to action. But Sirkinov is just a guy that if you put him in a bad position, he will quit. That Uzumiya knockout was the sketchiest knockout I've seen in 20 years of watching MMA. It's a farce, it's a joke, it looked like a work, it looked like a fix to me. And like I say, I know there'll be some jabronis in the comments be like, oh, I was a legitimate knockout, got caught behind the ear, Uzdemir is a powerful guy, it knocked off Uzdemir's equilibrium. All right, bro, whatever you want to say. I've never seen Jorge Masvidal drop like that. Whatever you say, mate. I've never seen, you know, I've never, I've, look, say what you want. If you want to justify, if you want to justify that knockout, whatever, bro, that's up to you. But don't tell me Sirkinov is ever going to be a decent bet at anything around even money when the guy is made of glass. I don't care how he's... I don't. I literally couldn't care less how he matches up with Ryan Spann from a technical point of view. This guy is made of glass. Please do not bet him. Please do not bet him. So from a technical point of view, if this fight stays standing, I do think Spann can do really, really well. 
Span, ironically, has a habit of getting rock drop, wobbled, and knocked out as well. Span actually gets wobbled in most of his fights. But the difference is, when Span gets wobbled, he actually tries to recover and fight through it. Whereas when Sirkinov gets wobbled, he turtles up and looks for a way out. Span is one of these guys, fights very long, fights very tall, has big power in his hands. And, you know, even though Sirkinov may be a little bit neater, a little bit more technical when it comes to striking, I think if both these guys get into exchanges, because of how chinny Sirkinov is, Span's going to have a huge advantage. I do think there's a really, really good chance Span knocks Sirkinov out in this fight. On the ground... You know, again, Sirkinov is just one of these weird guys because in flashes, Sirkinov does look like a high-level grappler. But then if you put him in a bad position, he turtles up caves and looks for a way out. Span is a decent submission grappler. Span, a little bit like Ige, is one of these guys that's a very good offensive wrestler but very, very weak off his back. If Sirkinov does get in the top position, Span will be in trouble. But from top position, Span can generate a lot of power with ground and pound. And he's likely to cause Sirkinov big trouble if he gets into top position. I don't really see the benefit in over-analyzing this one and talking about it too much. This is a clear dog or pass fight for me. Sirkinov has no chin. He's fighting a guy in Ryan Span who's big, strong, physically imposing, hits hard, six foot five. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bet Span a little. I'm gonna bet Span very small here. Both guys are very flaky, but I'm always going to bet against Sirkinov if his opponent's an underdog. Because one clean punch and this guy's head just melts. Like, there's no way you can bet this guy. So I will be betting a little bit on Span this weekend. Nothing major. Um, but I hope you found that useful. And, yeah, I just... I Just circling, I was a weird guy, man. He just always is looking for a way out. Very, very strange. Because from a technical point of view, he's very, very good. So we now move on to the main event. We're going to be talking about Leon Edwards against Baylal Mohammed, And there are a couple of X factors to take into consideration here. So let's talk about Baylal Mohammed and Leon Edwards. And first of all, let's start off with the X factors. So the first X factor that we should probably consider is that Leon Edwards has tested positive for coronavirus. So this article was per uh, published back in early December, which is obviously quite a long time ago now. It was about four months ago. But this is notable because we have heard about how coronavirus can impact a fighter's lung capacity. Or not a fighter's lung capacity, but a person's fight like lung capacity and, and, and affect their cardio, their breathing, all that kind of stuff, right? So Edwards has had a long time to get over this. Edwards is saying he's coming into this fight in the best shape of his life and he feels, you know, healthier than ever before but obviously we know fighters are gonna say those kind of things and until we see Edwards return on Saturday and kind of gauge how he performs you know we don't know if coronavirus is gonna have any long-term effect on on his gas tank it's also worth noting that Edwards hasn't fought since July 2019 which is almost two years ago now so there could be a little bit of ring rest there it is also worth noting though that at 29 years old it is very likely that Edwards has made big improvements in the last two years. So while ring rust may have a negative effect on his performance, it's also very possible he could show up looking better than ever. So I feel it's important to mention the ring rest, the long layoff, you know, the fact that Edwards has tested positive for coronavirus, just because we know that Bailal Mohammed is an absolute cardio machine. He's going to push a crazy pace here. He's going to come forward, get in Edwards' face and make him work. It's not easy to come off the bench after a two-year layoff and be thrown into the fire against someone like Mohammed that is going to make you work really, really hard. So I do wonder whether Edwards is going to kind of be able to keep up with the pace that Mohammed is going to be looking to set here. If we take a look at the odds on this fight, we can see that Edwards is a big favourite, right? Currently around about a 1.38 favourite, which is minus 263 for an implied probability of 72%. So to get any value here on Edwards, you've got to give him a better than 75% chance of winning, which is, is tricky, right, in MMA. It is tricky with so many ways that a fighter can lose, especially with a long layoff, especially with how good Baylor Mohammed is. And especially with the fact that we haven't seen Edwards fight since he since he contracted coronavirus. If we take a look at the odds on Bailal Mohammed, he's currently floating around about an average of 3.20, which is plus 220 for an implied probability of 31%. So the odds on Bailal Mohammed are obviously a lot more attractive. If we're looking at 
risk to reward ratios. It is very difficult to bet Edwards here at a big favourite odds, but Bailal's a little bit more attractive, so you know we should probably look for reasons to bet Bailal, right? So we've gone through a few of the X factors that go against Edwards, but Bailal Mohamed has also got his own issues, right? We recently saw him fight against Diego Lima literally just a month ago. And what's notable about this is that Bailon Mohamed took an enormous amount of damage in this fight to his left leg. Diego Lima absolutely hammered that left leg with leg kicks. And there's no way that Mohamed would have recovered from the damage he sustained to that leg quickly. Probably would have taken him a couple of weeks before he was able to train at full capacity again. And who knows, he might still be struggling with the effects of, of those leg kicks. He, his lead leg was beat up pretty bad to the point where he was forced to switch stances and go to southpaw in the fight. So, you know, this is going to be Bailon Mohamed's second weight cut in a month. You know, he took big damage to that lead leg. And even if he has fully recovered and is, you know, that lead leg, that left leg, isn't you know isn't isn't damaged anymore that likely will have disrupted his training over the last two weeks what i would say about Bailal Muhammad is that he is a genetic freak in the sense that he is one of these guys that just never gets tired he's got this never-ending genetic gas tank cardio for days the guy never slows down never breathes heavy he's just a cardio machine so under these circumstances you know second week in a month Probably not, hasn't been able to train very much in a month with that damage to his left leg. In these situations, I'd usually be saying that's a big issue for a fighter. But because Mohamed's gas tank is so legendary, I just don't think it's going to hold this guy back. The guy's just a machine. You know, I even remember a few years back, he fought during Ramadan, where he could, couldn't really eat for long periods of the day. And yet, he still like showed up and performed like an absolute beast, an absolute warrior. Didn't slow down at all. And just put an immense pace on his opponent like he always does. The guy's gas tank is phenomenal. Uh, he just never gets the second week in two weeks. A uh, second week in a month, and uh, you know his training perhaps not being as good as he would have hoped due to that left leg injury. You know I, I think Mohammed's tough enough to be just be able to fight through those those factors. So when we look at this fight from a stylistic point of view. I'm really, really surprised by what I saw when I went and watched the fight footage because Leon Edwards is one of these guys that's been talked about as being one of the best guys in the welterweight division and a guy that's been in the title picture for a very, very long time, right? But two years is a long time and your mind can play tricks on you. So a lot of the stuff we've been learning about Leon Edwards over the last two years has come from Twitter, it's come from the media, it's come from interviews and... All that stuff's cool and everything. Hype is all cool. But ultimately, the footage doesn't lie. And what I always say to people is, when I'm giving you these breakdowns, from my perspective, I'm not giving you my opinions. I'm giving you straight up facts. For me, what I'm doing here is no different between, you know, me saying to you, you know, Dave, Martin, Jeffrey, Craig, Paul, go open the window Look at the grass and tell me what color the grass is. When you come back and tell me, you know, the grass is green, you're not giving me your opinion. It's not your opinion that the grass is green. It's a fact. The grass is green. That's how I view these breakdowns, right? All I'm doing is spending a couple of hours researching these fights and then relaying to you what the footage showed me. And what's really interesting here is Edwards has been put on this pedestal as being, you know, one of the best guys in the division, a very dangerous striker, you know, in the title picture. But when you actually go back and watch Edwards' recent fights, it's quite underwhelming. And I don't think this guy is as good as people think he is. This, to some extent, can be seen in his MMA record. If you go back and look at his fights in the UFC, we can see he's had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 fights in the UFC, right? So Edwards is dubbed as this dangerous, explosive, you know, fast, athletic striker, this sniper almost, right? But if we look at his record, if we can accept that there was only one second left to go in this fight against Sabata and therefore this virtually went the distance, and if we can accept that Edwards submitted to Manov and this fight ended very late on in round three as well, 
realistically, in his 12 fights in the UFC, he's only won one fight by knockout. Only one fight by knockout in his 12 fights in the UFC. As you can see, the vast majority of Leon Edwards' fights have gone the distance. And this is very, very noticeable when you go and watch Leon Edwards' past fights. He's just not that dangerous. He's much more of a volume striker. And this is very interesting to me because Baylor Muhammad's biggest weakness is his boxing defense. Baylor Muhammad has a habit of getting rocked, dropped, and wobbled. The good thing about Muhammad is that he's tough as fuck. When he does get hurt bad, it's very difficult to put him away. Because he's tough as nails and he's able to recover very quickly. Don't get me wrong, you know, Edwards is a sniper. He does have power in his hands. You know, his head kick is his most dangerous weapon. But he's not as dangerous as you may think he is. Go back and watch his fight against RDA and Donald Cerrone to see what I mean. The RDA one is a really good fight to illustrate this. Because Leon Edwards is six foot two. Rafael Dos Anjos is five foot eight. You know, Dos Anjos used to fight at lightweight. Edwards is a very, very big welterweight, right? Edwards is big, strong, physically imposing. And yet Edwards couldn't get any respect from RDA when it came to striking. RDA literally came forward in a straight line, walked, walked Edwards down, walked through every single punch that Edwards threw. And Edwards just couldn't really hurt RDA with his box. And of course he cut him, he busted him up. But RDA just kept coming forward and, and, and Edwards couldn't actually get any respect in there from his boxing. That's really noticeable to me because remember what we've seen from Baylor Muhammad, right? He likes to come forward, take control of the center of the octagon, put a lot of pressure on his opponents, break them with volume and outwork them. In order to stop Baylor Muhammad from doing that, you've got to have the power in your hands to back him up and do exactly what Lyman Good did, right? Baylor couldn't come forward and put a lot of pressure on Good. Because when Good would open up, he would back Muhammad up and inflict significant damage. Baylor scraped through and won that fight, but the good the, the power in Good's hands caused him, you know, pretty big trouble. What's interesting here is I don't see Edwards being able to back Baylor Muhammad up that easily. Because Baylor Muhammad has made huge improvements to his head movement and footwork. His boxing defense is actually getting a hell of a lot better. So if you remember very recently, like last month, Mohamed caused Diego Lima loads of trouble by coming forward, putting a lot of pressure in Lima, forcing him to fight in an uncomfortable range, crowding him against the cage and kind of back boxing him up. I could actually see Baylor Mohamed having a decent amount of success with that strategy against Edwards because Lima's got a predominantly kick-space style of striking, and so does Edwards. Remember what we said earlier on, Edwards' head kick is his most dangerous weapon. Edwards isn't the best boxer, doesn't really have much power in his hands. So it's really, really interesting, because it's not easy to back someone up with kicks, because in order to throw a head kick, you need time and space to get your kick off, and Mohamed kind of crowds you and doesn't really give you that space, and he's tough enough to eat a shot to get inside. This is a really interesting fight for me because Edwards is definitely the more technical striker. But I do think Mohamed's blue collar, toughness, work rate and output can significantly close the skill gap and make this quite a competitive fight standing. On the ground this one's really interesting because Leon Edwards has extremely good takedown defense. Strong hips, great balance. Beautiful use of the underhooks. And Leon Edwards does a fantastic job of using the cage to defend takedowns. But where we were talking about Dan Ige earlier on as being one of these guys that, you know, some aspects of his grappling is very good. Offensively, he's very good. But he's very weak off his back. Edwards, unfortunately, has the same weakness. Edwards is one of these guys that's extremely difficult to take down. Maybe similar to Angela Hill in many ways. Very, very difficult to take down. But if you can get him down... We're talking white belt level on the ground, super low level, which is deceptive because when Edwards gets into top position, he's a decent grappler, man. Good grappling control, physically imposing, heavy ground and pound. But on his back, Edwards is useless, super low level. That's interesting to me because Baylor Mohammed is a decent grappler. He's got beautiful reactive double leg takedowns. In fact, he's got some of the best reactive double leg takedowns in the welterweight division which is only something that's emerged over the last two years or so. And so even though Edwards has really, really good takedown defense, Mohamed's offensive wrestling is good enough to test it. And what I really like about Mohamed is that he's persistent. 
you know, if an opponent is doing a really good job of shutting his wrestling down, he'll keep going to it throughout the fight. He's not the kind of guy that'll just get deterred from his opponent's stuff in takedowns. He'll keep spamming him for, you know, the entire duration of the matchup, which means his opponent can never really relax. And because Mel Baylon Muhammad is such a good offensive wrestler, that will open him, or that will create opportunities for him standing, and that will open Edwards up standing. Because when Baylon Muhammad's coming forward and he's trying to crowd Edwards and force him to fight in that uncomfortable range and put a lot of pressure on Edwards, Edwards won't be able to fully focus on kickboxing because in the back of his mind, he's going to have to have, you know, one eye on the takedown entry, which means he's not going to be able to fully commit to striking, not going to be able to fully commit to takedown offense. He's kind of going to be in some middle ground, which overall will probably make him, you know, a little bit less effective at defending takedowns uh, and also a little bit less effective with his, uh, his striking too. So I will be having, you know, a little gamble on Bail on Mohammed this weekend. Nothing major, but it's a good risk to reward ratio. I do think the fight is closer than the odds suggest. I do think the I do think the fight is closer than the odds uh, are right now. Um, Edward should definitely be the favourite, but the odds are definitely wide. I think Bail deserves more respect than this. He probably will lose, but the odds are decent. Decent risk to reward ratio on Bail. I think he can cause Edwards problems standing uh, and he can also cause him big trouble on the ground and realistically like I say the only guy Edwards has really knocked out in the UFC has been Seth Bozinski. Baylor Mohammed's very good. Baylor Mohammed is very very good. Do we see Edwards being able to knock Baylor Mohammed out when so many other guys have been able to go the distance with with Edwards and we know how tough Baylor is. And then realistically, Bailal works so hard, his output is so high. It's going to be difficult for Edwards to match that volume. If this fight goes the distance, you know, which I think has got a great chance of going the distance, it's going to be very difficult for Edwards to win a decision here because of how busy Muhammad is, how hard he works, you know, how many strikes he throws, the takedowns he spams. He's a hustler, man, and I love him for it. He's a great fighter. So I will be having a little bit of a gamble on Bailal this weekend. Nothing major. Good risk to reward ratio, though. The odds should be closer than they are. And, uh, yeah, should be a great fight, man. One of the very few interesting fights on this card. So I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please subscribe to my channel. I would love to break 5,000 subscribers by the end of the month. I think we're only like 15 off. We're going to do it. Please make it happen for me, boys. And uh, yeah, if you haven't already, hit the like button. If this video gets 200 likes, I'll do the prop bet live stream on Saturday, a couple of hours before the event takes place. And look, this video is going to get a decent amount of views, way more than 200. So please hit the like button. No reason why you can't. doesn't cost you anything. But with that, take care, everyone. And I will see you in the next video. I hope you crush it this weekend. Have a great week, boys. And uh, I'll speak to you soon.